but we'll keep our social distance. So greet one another online. Just type something or give a thumbs up or do something to greet one another. Look at who's watching. And uh, if you're watching later in a watch party or you're watching later in YouTube, just connect with somebody. Just say hello to somebody. I'll give you a minute to do that. Just say hello. Connect with somebody and connect with somebody that you can serve this week. We're going to explore it as we go through God's Word some ways we can still serve one another, some ways that we can still connect, and ways that we can do something together. Psalm 118, 24. We've been in Psalm 118. It's been quoted in Matthew several times over the last few weeks. Psalm 118, 24, one of my favorite verses says, This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. We have a choice no matter whether we're sitting at home. You see, the problem with this, this coronavirus, the um, uh, being quarantined, we go through processes just like grieving a loss. We go through times of anger, and I've been angry this week. We go through times of being sad and depressed, and I've been depressed this week. We go through times of denial and pretending like it's not there and pretending like uh, everything's normal. We go through times of bargaining where we think somehow we're going to cheat whatever's going on or, or be better than it. it. It's exactly the stages of grief. 
But, but the one thing we can do is we can choose to accept where we are and we can choose to worship the God who's bigger than, than this whole situation. And that's what we want to do over the next few songs. We want to look to the God who's bigger than however you're feeling right now. If you're angry, take it to Jesus. If you're feeling depressed, take it to Jesus. If you're bargaining, take it to Jesus and just put it in his hands and let him have it. If you're denying it, just go to Jesus and ask him for some reality. Something we call worship. Worship is when I focus on Jesus more than my problems. When I focus on Jesus more than myself. Uh, Psalm 118 verse 14 says, The Lord is my strength. He is my song. He is my salvation. He's our only strength. He's our song. So wherever you are right now in your living room or wherever you are, unless, of course, you're driving, um, would you just get into a posture of worship some way? Maybe that means kneeling. To me, a posture of worship means changing the way I am. Maybe it means standing if I've been seated. Maybe it means kneeling. Uh, feel free to raise your hands. It may feel funny at first in your living room raising your hands or speaking in tongues or shouting out the praises of Jesus, but I think your neighbors need to hear you now. I think your neighbors need to know that you worship in the Spirit of God. So would you worship with a reckless abandon today? Would you just uh, worship just like uh, the King has returned and Jesus is here? Would you allow Him to be present in your life and allow His Spirit to fill you? Dear Lord, I ask you, would you just uh, help us to worship you right now? Help us to come near you, whatever we're feeling, whether we're sad or whether we're angry or whether we're denying everything and not living in our reality. Uh, Lord, if we're just uh, confused and trying to bargain something right now, Lord, would you just let your reality come into our life? Would you be larger than whatever we're feeling right now? And would you draw us together as we worship across an entire region, across, a, across maybe a nation or a whole world today, Lord, together? Would you just um, bring us together, Lord? And if there's someone new watching this, someone new to this church, just let them feel that they're part of something bigger, Lord. Thank you as we begin to worship you now, Jesus.
them right now, Lord God. Wow. 
I will sing of the goodness of God. Thank you, Jesus. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You are close like no other, known you as a father, known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God all my life. Seers, would you just praise him? Would you just lift your voice and praise him? Worship him. Find out the garment of praise lifts up the spirit of heaviness. Lord, you are the one who gives us strength when we're str- when we have no power. And Lord, I know there's someone who's watching right now that has no power. Would you give them your strength? Would you let your spirit just uh, descend upon that room and show them that you're the God who's still in charge, Lord? And Lord, you give a song to those who are sorrowful. Would you just? Uh, Give us a song this morning, Lord, would you just, in every home and every person watching this, Lord, all around this world, would you just give them a song today, Lord? And Lord, you give us our salvation. Would you save us today, Lord? Would you rescue us from the things of this earth? Would you rescue us from the sin and the things of the world that get on us, the the goals and motives of this world, and Lord, and show us a, a new goal today. Show us your eternity and show us that you are our reward, that you are our goal, Lord. We sing the day of your goodness, Lord, and we ask you, Lord, would you just let everyone who's watching this, would you just let them know your goodness today, Lord? We can talk about it, but knowing it by, by, by you moving into their room and they sense your presence, Lord, that's what we need today, Lord. Just lift us and let us know that you're still the God who's in charge. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, we're in Matthew. And Liberty Community Church, we preach through whole books of the Bible, and um, I tend to not move away from that. So in spite of a coronavirus pandemic, I still think it's comforting that we stay in the same place where we were, and we keep moving forward. And we've been talking about the Lord's return, which is probably very appropriate where we are. 
Next week we're going to look at uh, the price Jesus paid for us. And then the following week is Easter and we finish up Matthew and we're likely moving into Leviticus from there. So welcome if you have a Bible, um, open it up to Matthew chapter 24. We're starting in verse 36 and we'll, we'll continue on through chapter 25. Um, we'll, we'll continue through. the. Uh, you know, the, one of the problems with this pandemic is the uncertainty. If we just knew how it was going to work out. I find myself watching more news than I should. find myself looking at news sites more than I should. And it's because I want some certainty. I want to know what's going to happen. And the truth is, we don't have a lot of certainty. We don't have much to give us certainty. Jesus taught us last week, he said, when we see the fig tree coming out, when we see the tree beginning to get tender and we see the buds beginning to come out, we know that summer is near. And the certainty of it is true. It's not the fig tree that brings summer. Summer is certainly coming and the fig tree knows that it's coming. So there's a certainty to it. Jesus says in verse 36, concerning the day and hour, nobody knows. Nobody knows the day and hour that Jesus returns and says that's enough of this world. There, there are two kinds of people that will be taking part in this today. Uh, there are the people who don't feel like Jesus is returning and that there isn't such a thing as judgment. And there are the people who live every moment of their life in the constant awareness that Jesus is returning and that everything we see here is frail and falling apart. The good, the bad, the ugly, all of it is disappearing. It's all going to go away. All of our motives, the car you drive, the jobs that we're so stressed about losing right now, the homes that we're so stressed about losing, none of them are eternal. All of the things that we think are so important here on this earth that we give our whole 70, 80, or 100 years here on this earth toward, in the certainty of Jesus' return, those things aren't as certain as we thought. So there is really only one thing that we can be certain of, and that's that Jesus is going to return that this world will not continue on the same path that it always has, that Jesus will return. But Jesus says concerning the day and hour, nobody knows specifically the hour. We know the time is right. We know that Jesus could return before we end this. We know that he could come back and take his long before this service ever ends. We know that. Or he could be another thousand years and we couldn't fault him either way. Jesus says not the angels in heaven nor even Jesus as he walked the earth, but only the Father knows. Only the Father knows when the end is here. Remember in the Greek sense, the end means the completion, the finish. Only God knows when this is done. It's completed. What he was doing here on this earth is now finished. He says in that day, it'll be like the days of Noah. That's what the coming of the Son of Man will be like. Well, how was the days of Noah? Well, in the days of Noah, it was only Noah and his family that was found righteous. The rest of the earth, according to this, were doing all sorts of things. Before the flood, it says they ate and they drank and they were marrying and giving in marriage. They were doing regular stuff. Genesis tells us they were full of sin and full of iniquity, full of things that separated them from God. Sin is whatever separates us from God. And whatever, say, it could be marriage, it could be home, it could be eating and drinking, it could be worrying about what we're going to eat or drink, it could be worrying about things of this earth. Sin is what separates us from God, and in the days of Noah they were separated from God. They couldn't hear his voice saying that something was about to come in and change everything. Just like the end that's about to come and change everything here, this was about to change everything. It says they were unaware. Why were they unaware, God? I don't think Noah was special. I think he's just the only one that would listen to God. I don't know but what God hadn't spoke to everybody to go make an ark. I don't, they certainly saw Noah building an ark. They certainly saw that there was some, something different. But they were unaware of the voice of God. Until the flood came and swept them all away. Do you remember the story in Genesis? Noah and his family went in the ark and God shut the door of the ark. When the door shut on the ark, there was no way back into the ark. There was a sharp division. What we have to understand about the return of Christ is it's two things, or three things. It's certain. It's going to happen. It's going to happen suddenly, and we don't know when. It's going to come upon us quickly, just like the, the flood came and the door shut, and it's also going to be unalterable. Those on the outside of the door can't get in and those inside can't get out. Once Christ comes, there is a division and a very sharp division. We'll look at that division in just a second. Because it swept them away and that's what Jesus says will be like the coming of the Son of Man. 
Sin leaves us unprepared. And sin is whatever makes us unprepared. Sin is whatever makes us say in our heart that the Lord's not returning or He's not coming back. We believe He's coming back. And we believe that all the things of this earth that, that we think are so important aren't as important as we think. There are only two things that matter, and that's God's Word. It wasn't that the conclusion last week, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. God's Word and the souls of, of human beings. Those are the only two things that are going into eternity. God's Word will be there, and our souls will be there, and one place will be outside the door or inside the door. So it's the only thing worth working on. Verse 40, two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. What's the point of that? Jesus says, suddenly, without any chance of going back and changing anything, uh, suddenly and quickly, in the middle of their life, while they're in the field working, one of them's gone, one of them's still here. It's a sudden and irreparable break, and it just brings in and happens right in the middle of everyday life, just like with Noah. And then in verse 41, two women will be grinding at the mill. The mills in those days, the small mill involved a stone about that big around, and it had a handle on it. So two women would grind. One would push it to here. The other would grab it and pull it. The other would grab it. And each one of them would pull the wheel about 180 degrees around. Well, one day two women are grinding at the wheel just like that, and all of a sudden this one pushes the wheel here and nobody takes it because they're gone. Sudden. It can't be changed. It's unalterable. It's sudden and it's sure. It happens. Two women grinding. The point of that is one's taken, one's left. The division is sudden and it happens instantly. Therefore, because of that, because it's sudden, unalterable, drops in and changes everything, it's not like you're getting a warning. It's not like Ten minutes ahead, Jesus is going to say, hey, the world's about to end and I'm coming back. And, and all of a sudden you can get things ready. It just suddenly happens. It just drops on you like a thunderclap, like lightning from the sky unexpectedly. It just drops in on you. So therefore, stay awake. Therefore, always pay attention because you never know exactly when this is going to happen. So, For you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. But know this, here's what we can know. We don't know what day he's coming. We don't know what hour he's coming. But we do know this, that if the master of the house had known when the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and he wouldn't have left his house to be broke into. If you knew there was a thief roaming your neighborhood tonight and you knew he was likely to break into your house tonight, you might stay awake and wait for him. If the master knew that the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake. So the problem is, we don't know that Jesus is coming. And here's the problem. It's what I call motivated ignorance. I used to argue with a psychologist friend of mine whether this actually exists or not. I think it does. Sometimes we're ignorant of something because we don't want to know it. We want to go on and eat and drink and be given in marriage and do whatever we want to do. We want to live our life the way the West, rest of the world's living. And this idea that there's going to be a sudden break that changes everything, that idea changes everything about how we live our lives. So sometimes we just don't want to know it. We just don't want to imagine it. An ancient monk was working in his garden one day, and a guy came up to him trying to trip him up. And he said to him, he said, what would you be doing if you knew the Lord was coming back right now? And the monk looked up from his hoe where he was hoeing his garden, and he said, I would be hoeing this garden. Point is, it's sudden, it's unalterable. Whatever you're doing at any given moment needs to be exactly what you would be doing if you knew the Lord was coming back in this moment. I grew up living in this. We called it the fear of God. Uh, we were afraid to do something wrong for fear the Lord would come back in the middle of us doing something. I was afraid to think something wrong because I was afraid the Lord would come back. And, and I know sometimes we make fun of that idea, but this is exactly what Jesus is teaching us. Live in the constant awareness that there is a Lord, the one in charge, who's coming back. If he had known when the thief is coming, well, he would have prepared for the thief. He wouldn't have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you... The Greek there is a reflexive. You yourself. Jesus shifts it. You. You right there. You. That one. You, you. You're responsible individually for this. This is not something we can do together as a church. This is something you're, you have to prepare your life for the coming of the Lord. Therefore, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you don't expect. Again, 
suddenly and unexpected. So verse 45, who is the faithful and wise servant? Who is faithful and wise? What does it take to be faithful and wise as a servant? What it takes, the first thing it takes if we're going to be ready for Jesus' return is to understand we have a responsibility. Jesus did not put you on this earth to take up space, to breathe oxygen, to run around and consume. The world tells you you're a consumer. The world tells you it's giving you what you need. The world tells you it's your job to receive what it gives you. The truth is you are not put here to receive from the world. You're not a consumer of the world. You were put here to make a difference. You have a responsibility to make a difference. So who is the faithful and wise servant who the master has set over the household to give them their food at the proper time? In other words, this servant in this story was put over a household in order to serve the household. This servant had someone that he was in charge of. All of us are first of all a servant. The word in Greek is doulos. Doulos means literally a slave. You are literally a slave. Uh, I'm not a slave, I'm free. You're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to Jesus and there is no in between. You are a slave to Jesus and knowing that he's returning and knowing your master's returning or you're a fool and you think you're the master of your own world and there's never going to be a time when the counts are called in and Jesus is returning. Who is this faithful and wise servant who has set over, the Lord has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Why is he over top of the household? Not because he's important, not because he's great, not so that he can lord it over people so he can give the food out to those who need it at the proper time. You were put here with the responsibility to serve someone. Maybe it's your family, maybe it's your neighbor, maybe it's others in this church, but you have a responsibility. And living in light of the Lord's sudden return and uninterruptible return means that I have a responsibility. When I wake up in the morning, I have a responsibility toward others that day. That day, this day that the Lord gave me, I'll rejoice and be glad in it because He has given me a responsibility. Blessed is that servant whom the master will find so doing when he comes. Won't it be great when the master returns? And that's exactly what the servant is doing, is giving his food to the others and taking care of the estate. Truly, I say to you, he'll put him over all his possessions. There'll be a sudden return, and that that servant will be in charge of more things. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed. Let's unpack that for a second. Wickedness is to say my master is delayed. You know, we act like kindergartners. We really do. Teacher walks out of the room of a kindergarten class. Kindergartners act like that teacher ain't ever coming back. And the only thing they're worried about, I remember we'd post a sentry at the door to see if we could see the teacher coming back down the hall. You know why we want to set a date to Jesus' return so bad? It's because we want to fool him and get ready just before he gets here. We don't want to actually want to serve him before. We act like kindergartners going wild and saying, no, the teacher will never be back. Do whatever you want. But you know what I learned in school? The teacher always comes back. And they're always mad when you've destroyed the room. They always come back. But the wicked servant says, my master is delayed. This earth is just going to keep going on the same way it always had. You know something? That idea stinks to me. In the age of coronavirus, in the age where lying is how we move forward, in the age where consumerism is all there is, in the age where half the world lives on a dollar a day and and there are people in the world that have billions of dollars, in that age, in that world, I, I, I say, Lord, come quickly. I don't want the master to be delayed. I think this world has had enough of what it is. But the wicked servant says, my master is delayed. And so what does he do? He begins to beat his fellow servants. And he eats and drinks with the drunkards. You you know what it does when we say the Lord is delayed? First of all, it makes me careless. It makes me not care what the Lord wants. It makes me sloppy with things. It makes me careless with my time, talent, and treasure. The things the Lord has given me, I'm careless with them. It also makes me cruel. Why is the world so cruel? You know why the world's so cruel? Because they don't know that the Lord is coming back. They don't know He's returning. Why are people so mean? Because they don't know Jesus is coming back. We wouldn't treat our fellow humans the way we do. We wouldn't have people with billions while others are starving if we knew the Lord was coming back. We wouldn't have people beating one another and abusing children if we knew the Lord was coming back. At any moment, He could walk through the door. We wouldn't do that. And we wouldn't have carousing. Notice how I made it all seize. Uh, so you can remember it. Carelessness, uh, cruelty, and carousing. 
What is carousing? I, you know, I know people argue with me all the time. It's, it's fine. Christians can drink. I, I don't know why you would, okay? But this says they ate and drank with the drunkards, okay? It made them carouse. It made them throw a party. Forget it. The Lord ain't coming back. Let's go hang out. It doesn't matter who I hang out with. It doesn't matter who I spend time with. If being quarantined in your house has taught you anything, it should teach you that who you hang out with really does matter. I'm stuck in the house with four people, and I'm glad for the four people I'm stuck with. I am. I, there's nobody else I would rather, and I've got Amanda and Jacob, and they've, we've maintained our quarantine between our homes, and, and you know something? I'm glad for the people that I'm stuck with. I miss you all, but I'm glad for the people I'm stuck with, because some of the people I don't see aren't influencing me anymore. This is a great season to get ready for the Lord's return. So, so he beats his fellow servants. He eats and drinks with the drunkards. The master of that servant's going to come on a day when he didn't expect him in an hour that he doesn't know. He's going to walk in the door. The teacher's coming back in the room. The master is coming back in the room. The boss is coming. I remember we, when I, one of the first jobs I had was cutting grass. We were on Fort Belvoir cutting grass. And, and, and as soon as the boss would get in his truck, the first day I was there, boss got in his truck and he had to go get something. And as soon as he got out of sight, every push mower we were running got flipped upside down and all the gas ran out on the ground. Because he'd made the mistake of forgetting to bring his gas can and he put it in the back of the truck. And so we said, they all said, we ran out of gas as soon as you left. And they were all sitting there when he came back. The master was not happy when he came back and we dumped all the gas out of our mowers. He was not happy. We got to rest for five minutes, but the master is coming back. What does he do? Well, well an hour he doesn't know. He'll cut him into pieces. That's pretty cruel, isn't it? You know, cut him in half. Put him in with the hypocrites. In that place, there'll be weeping or gnashing of teeth. All right, so here's the thing. When we don't believe Jesus is coming back, often we don't believe in judgment. I don't believe God's going to judge things. You know, the only thing about the future that makes any sense at all to me is judgment. Christ's return makes no sense to me. He came 2,000 years ago and we nailed him to a cross. Why on earth would he come back? I wouldn't. Forget you all. I'd let the earth just keep spinning. Let us just keep destroying each other. But he does promise he's returning. In eternal life, none of us deserve it. What a gracious God to give us eternal life. It's a great gift. None of us have earned it. None of us deserve it. Jesus paid the price for it. We'll look at that next week. Judgment is the only thing in the future that does make sense. It does make sense that there's a God above who's going to call in the accounts. The person who abused you years ago is going to pay the price. It does make sense that the person who's beating and, cho and choosing to abuse other people will one day pay the price. It makes sense that the one who hoards billions while people are starving, it makes sense that there'll be a judgment for that, doesn't it? It's the only reasonable thing. So in your thinking, don't throw out the return of Christ thinking, well, God's never going to judge things. Jesus says that's what the wicked and foolish servant says. So, so what do we need to understand here? We need to understand that when I lose the lordship of Christ, when I, under, when I don't think he's coming back, when I don't think he's in charge and actually going to judge things, eventually I'll lose myself. Eventually I'll be cast aside from my own self. In hell there is no self. I don't believe in a hell, Pastor. I, I don't care if you believe in it or not. There's something that's coming suddenly. It's certainly coming, and it is an inalterable division. And that division is being with Jesus or being away from Jesus. I don't know if hell has literal flames in it or not. I have no idea. I do know that's not going to be your biggest problem in hell. The biggest problem in hell is there is no presence of God. There is no hope. There is no future. The door has been shut and the water is rising. One has been taken and the other has been left. It's sudden and irreparable. So he gives us some stories here. and We're going to try to unpack the stories. Because, first of all, I have a responsibility in light of the Lord's return. The second thing I need to know is that I need to be constantly filled with the Spirit of God. I need to be overflowing in the Spirit of God constantly. I don't know what you've been doing while you've been sitting at home or while you've been going to work and you can't go shopping and you can't do the normal things that you do, but I do know what we ought to be doing, and that's we ought to be filled with the Spirit constantly. We ought to be overflowing continually in the Spirit because the Spirit that I have, you know what this, this whole quarantine will teach you? It'll teach you that you can't ride on the spirit that I'm filled. 
You can't take my overflowing and do something with it. You can only be filled with the Spirit on your own. The Spirit is for each and every one of us. The tongues of fire settled on each and every one of them, and each and every one of them began to speak in tongues. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. I guess the tradition was this, okay? They would have a big wedding feast, and a lot of them happened at night. And part of the wedding feast was the ten bridesmaids, literally they were the bridesmaids, would go out when the groom started coming toward the wedding ceremony, the ten bridesmaids would go out, about meet the groom halfway, and escort the groom back in great fanfare back to the wedding. So ten, there were ten bridesmaids here, and they went out to meet this, bri this bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. I love the Greek word there. It's mori, where we get moron from. So basically it says five of them were morons, and five of them were wise. Five of them were blithering idiots. Five of them were dumber than a hayrake, and five of them made good sense and were wise. Well, how do we know in light of Christ's return whether I'm a moron or whether I'm actually being filled with the Spirit of God and I'm a wise one? How do I know? For the foolish, they took their lamps, but they didn't take any oil with them. Now, a lamp in those days, what it's talking about is literally a torch. And a torch had to be dipped into oil. And a torch in those days would burn for about 15 minutes of olive oil, and then a torch would go out. So you have about 15 minutes of light before you need to trim it and put it back in some oil and relight it. So you get about 15 minutes. It says the fools, they didn't bother to take any oil with them. They're, they got light for 15 minutes and then no more light. It doesn't say that they had no oil. Uh, Pastor, are you saying people aren't filled with the... I'm saying everybody has some oil. It's just whether you got oil that's overflowing or not. The wise, they took flask of oil with their lamps. And the bridegroom was delayed. Would you agree our bridegroom's been delayed for 2,000 years? It's easy to say he's not returning. It's been 2,000 years. There has been a delay, and many in the church have chosen to just get by. They've not chosen to overflow. They're sitting there asleep and not, and not being ready to do what God has called them to do. They all became drowsy. All of them did, the good and the bad, the wise and the foolish. There's nothing wrong with sleep. It doesn't say it was a bad thing, so they went to sleep. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. 1 Thessalonians 4, 6 says when he returns, there'll be a trumpet and the sound of God, the, the, very, the, the, the very voice of God, the very voice of an archangel will ring through this earth suddenly like lightning falling from the ground. They wake from their sleep. The bridegroom is coming. Come out to meet him. So all the virgins, all ten of them, got up and arose and they started trimming their lamps and getting the charred pieces off the cloth and getting ready to relight their lamps. And as they trimmed their lamps, the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. Let us dip our lamps into your oil. But the wise answered saying, and get this, okay, it's not that they're bad people and they're not going to share. The problem is if they give their oil, then there won't be enough oil for anybody and nobody will have any oil. So, and then the groom is going to come and there won't be a procession. There won't be the lights that were supposed to be there. He says there will not, it says there won't be enough for us and for you. Go to the dealers and buy for yourself. There has to be oil in your lamp. The time to be filled with the Spirit is now. Not when you see the Lord returning. That's suddenly an instant. When you see the Lord returning, it's already too late. One of the things Jesus is going to say is, did you do what I gave you the responsibility to do? And the second thing he's going to say is, were you filled with my Spirit? The Spirit comes from eternity. The Spirit draws us toward eternity. The Spirit empowers us to live today. He literally is the oil that's in our vessel. And, and you know something? We need that oil every day. I don't know what's coming when this coronavirus age, but I do know if you're filled with the Spirit, you'll be ready for it. We need to practice being filled with the Spirit every moment, every day. We need to keep our oil, oil container filled because the truth is when the crisis comes here on earth or when Jesus returns, I don't have enough oil to give you. I've got to burn mine. It would be an affront to Jesus if he came back and no one had any oil. And while they were going to buy, notice there are two directions here. The wise go with Jesus. The foolish now have to go in the opposite direction. Again, a sharp division. The division is, is there oil or is there not oil? Are you filled with the Spirit? Are you not filled with the Spirit? It's the division. 
Pastor, are you saying you have to be filled with the Spirit to be saved? I'm saying you get to be filled with the Spirit if you're saved. I'm saying that salvation is the vessel, the Spirit is the oil that fills the vessel. And I'm wondering, when you face Jesus and say, well, Jesus, I didn't need to be filled with your Spirit, I'm really wondering what that's going to look like. In this age, in this day, in these crises we face, don't you need all of Jesus that you can possibly get? And then while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. And get this, the door was shut. Just like the ark, just like the one that was left at the wheel, the door was shut. And afterward, the other virgins, the five foolish ones, came and said, Lord, Lord, notice they call him Lord. Chapter 7, verse 21 through 33, do you remember Jesus taught us not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven? They still see him as Lord, they're just not filled with his presence. Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I don't know you. Why doesn't he know them? Well, the relational Holy Spirit is a relationship. Being filled with the Spirit is a relationship with Jesus. That's the Spirit of Jesus, no less. And that relationship is literally knowing Jesus. To know Him and know Him perfectly. To know Him in His presence. That's what it is to know Jesus. You can read the Bible and know of Jesus, but the Bible leads us to the presence of Jesus. So if we don't accept the presence of God in our life today, what makes us think He's going to accept us in His presence then? Watch, therefore, again, it's suddenly you don't know the day or the hour. Notice a few things here. First of all, notice that if you play games with your eternity, if you don't want eternity with Jesus, he's not going to force it on you. If you don't want to encounter that eternity today in the power of the Spirit, he's not going to make you accept that eternity. If you don't want eternity, you're not going to have eternity. Notice in this story, every one of them was invited. You're invited. All of us are invited to the fullness of the presence of God. Every one of us. They all responded. The five fools didn't say we won't go. The five fools actually went. They responded. They had a sense of responsibility to the bridegroom. Yes, I, I believe Jesus and I believe I have a responsibility. Okay, the first point here that we, need, we have a responsibility ain't enough. Not only do we have a responsibility, we need to be filled with His presence constantly. Notice they all called Him Lord. Every one of them called Him Lord. And they all waited for Him. I'm waiting for the Lord's return. You're not waiting if you're not filled with the oil of the Spirit. You're not waiting if you're not overflowing in the oil of the Spirit. How do I minister in the age of coronavirus? I don't know, but the Spirit does. I don't have the power to care for people. I don't either, but the Spirit does. This is not a shock to Jesus. None of this surprises him. I've been disconcerted with the church for a couple of years. I've been bothered by how complacent and how lazy we've gotten and how we just sit around and act like we don't care. We, we look more like these fools who beat each other and divide and tear up one another and, and begin to eat and drink and do whatever we want. That's what we, I've been frustrated with that for some years. You know something? The Spirit knew this was coming. And this is going to shake the church. It's going to shake this church. It's going to shake out those who aren't waiting for Jesus. And it's going to draw those who are waiting for Jesus together. I look forward to this season. You know why? Because the worst thing can happen to me is I'm with Jesus. That's the worst. And that's the best thing that could ever be. So I have no fear and no, wet, no doubt. And why do I have that? It's because I'm filled with the Spirit of God. Watch, therefore, for you don't know the day or the hour. Now, the next story, this one is taken out of context more often than just about any story in the Bible, okay? Because in the next story, we, we all have to serve. And the point of this next story is that Jesus puts you here to serve. When he returns, will he find you doing what you're responsible for, family, whatever you're responsible to lead, to feed, to take care of? Will he find you filled with the Spirit, and will he find you serving? You exist to serve others. You exist to serve the church. Your spiritual gifts are about serving one another in this church. And we're going to talk a little about how difficult it might be to use our spiritual gifts in the age where we're separated by the internet, but I think we can do it, and the Spirit has a way we can do it. 
I believe the Spirit can lead us toward new freshness and new fruit and a new life in this, this current age. For it'll be like a man who goes on a journey and he called his servants and he entrusted them with his property. Guy's getting ready to go away. The owner's getting ready to go away and he trusts them with his property. He gives one of them five talents. A talent is about 75 pounds of gold. So in today's world, that's about $1.6 million. I did the math, okay? So five talents is nearly $9 million. So he leaves, and he, you see, what God has entrusted you with is huge. He hasn't given you a penny. He's given you a thing, a, a life. He's given you a season on this earth that is absolutely priceless, and you're to do something with it. All of us were given something. To another, he gave two talents. That was only $3.2 million. Just $3.2 million, that's all. And then, and then he gave another one one talent. He only gave him $1.6 million. Everybody, according to his ability, got something, okay? You know why? Because the master had some sense of who was going to make use of it and who wasn't anyhow. The master already knows what's coming. Why do some people have more than you when it comes to spiritual things? Because the master knows that those people are going to use it. Then he went away. And he who had received five talents went at once and he traded them and he made five talents more. So he, traded, he doubled it into ten talents. He used it. He took what God gave him. He took what the Lord gave him and he gave, got more out of it. He used it to invest. He took the things that God gave him and he used it to bless others. And the one who had, ta who had two talents did the same thing. But the one who had one talent went and dug it in the ground and hid his master's money. Yes, I have salvation I'm saved, now I'm going to put it in my pocket. I checked a form, a box a few years ago, and I'm going to put it in my pocket, and that's my ticket to get into heaven one day. But I don't want to lose that ticket, so I'm putting it in my pocket. You know something? Your salvation was given to you so that you could see others saved. It was given to you so you could risk it, so you could put it out there. Uh, well, I was filled with the Holy Spirit 10 years ago. I spoke in tongues, and now I've put it in my pocket, and I've got a little flask of oil that I'm trying to hide in my pocket. Now that little flask of oil is going to dry up because we continually have to use it, risk it, put it out there. We continually have to use what God gave us or we lose it. We'll see that in just a second. This guy, he, he felt safety was the, the goal here. You know, your safety here on this earth is not the goal. In the age of coronavirus, we're, we're quarantining. There are only five, six people in this church building right now. We're following the wisdom, okay? I'm not saying go out and be foolish with it. But I am saying your safety and your security, your bank account, your nest egg, if you have one still after the, the economic collapse we've had in the last few weeks, that was never the goal. Safety is never safe. The only safety is Jesus. He's the only thing that's safe. And the fear of failure will always lead to one thing, failure. When we're afraid of it, it's what's going to happen. Well, this guy was afraid he would lose it, so he hid it. He was afraid. You, you, you know, some of us are so afraid of losing our salvation, we think the goal of Christianity is to do nothing. And if that were true, the most holy thing in the world would be a rock because it doesn't do anything. We have to do stuff. And when you do stuff, people judge stuff. When you do stuff, you might get it wrong, but we have to risk it if we're going to gain something from it. The fear of failure keeps us paralyzed, and we'll see what Jesus has to say about that because we have to steward and serve with what we have. Now, after a long time, the master of the servant came, the master of the so servants came back and he settled the accounts. Again, there's a judgment. Again, there's a difference. Uh, he who had received the five talents came and he said, Look, master, you delivered me five talents and I've made you five more. So the master says to him, and I love this, this is what I want Jesus to say to me, Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. You have been faithful over a little. I'm going to give you much in eternity. Enter into the joy, and the word for joy there is the banquet, the party, the festival, the, the festival we see in Revelation 22, the great marriage supper of the Lamb. Enter into the party. Enter into your master's joy. And he who had two talents did the same thing. He came up and said, look, Lord, I've doubled your money. And he says the same to him. Well done, good and faithful servant. But he, in verse 24, who had received one talent, came forward and said, Master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you didn't sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. This doesn't say God is a hard man who takes where he doesn't deserve it because God deserves everything. 
God can't take. He sowed it all. So, so if you want to look at Jesus in this story, he deserves it all. And, and I've had people, well, I think God, if God's a big, mean, judgmental God, I don't want to serve him. You know, I think that's absolutely foolish. If you really believe God is a big, mean, judgmental God, you probably should be serving him more than I am. I believe he's a great, big, loving God, but I also believe he does call the accounts in. The Bible tells us he loved me enough to die for me. We're going to look at that next week. He is a gracious and gift-giving God while we live in this age. But if you're one of those people who thinks God is mean and thinks God is just waiting to strike us, you should be serving him all the more. The fact that you believe God is harsh doesn't mean that you don't serve him. He says, I was afraid. I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But it wasn't what was his, because what was his was the increase. What Jesus wants from us is the increase. What he wants in this season is the people that we have blessed because of what he's given us. If Jesus has put it in your hand, he's given it to you to give to somebody else. The master calls him and he says, you wicked and slothful servant. You know, the real problem here is that this guy puts himself first. It's a real problem in our age too. Me first. I want my own security. The goal of life in America right now is for me to be first and to discover my own security. If this crisis teaches us anything, it teaches us that we're going to have to put others first if we're going to survive. And it also teaches us that we know our security is not nearly as secure on this earth as we thought it was. You knew I reaped where I didn't snow and I gathered where I had scattered no seed then you ought to have invested the money with the bankers. If you knew that about God, if you know there's a judgment coming and you, know, and you believe God is going to call the accounts in, you ought to do something with what you have in your hand right now because he might return today. And you ought to do something with the blessing that he's given you. He says, yeah, I would like to receive my own even with some interest. So take the talent from him who gave, who, who, and give it to the one who has ten talents. Take the one and give it to the one who has ten. For to every one who has, more will be given. And he will have an abundance. From everybody who's using what God is doing in their life and blessing others, he'll be given more. But the one who has not, what he has will be taken away. Cast that, again, worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place they'll be weeping and gnashing teeth. Again, there's a sharp division. Notice there are only two categories in every one of these stories. There are those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. There isn't a third category here. Yeah, we have seekers in our church. No, we don't have seekers in our church. We have those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. And the problem is, Jesus taught us this back a few chapters ago. In the church, we can't tell the difference. The wheat and the weeds grow together. The good fish and the bad fish are in the same net. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference when we're a church together. Sometimes it's hard to tell who's actually waiting for Jesus and who's not. When the Son of Man, verse 31, comes in his glory, if you've got your Bible out, underline the word when. It doesn't say if, when he comes back. And he'll have his glory. The light will shine around him. And if you don't want to give him glory now, you ain't going to like that day either. And all the angels will be with him. And then he will sit on his glorious throne. Why? Because he's in charge. He is in charge now, and he'll be in charge then. Before him will be gathered all the nations. Say it with me wherever you are. That's me. I'm part of that. Before him, I'm in, the, I'm in this picture. I'm there. You're there. Every one of us is there. All the nations will be before him. And he will separate people one from another. Again, a sharp division. Those who are in, those that are out. As a shepherd would separate the sheep from the goats. They let the sheep and goats run among each other. They were out in the same pasture. They let them run among each other. But sheep were considered valuable and goats were pretty valueless. They weren't nearly as valuable as the sheep. So the shepherd, because they required different care, would have to occasionally go separate the sheep from the goats. And he'll place the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left hand. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Do you know what your purpose has always been? Do you know what the whole purpose of the world is? The kingdom that's coming. 
The purpose, our creation was founded in our end. The foundation of the world. Jesus had the idea at the very beginning that there would be an eternity and that was your purpose all along. So literally it says, come and be a part of the thing that you were made for in the beginning. Come and be a part of the thing that makes you complete. Why? Because I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. Get this next one. I was sick and you visited me. Keep your quarantine up. There are ways to visit now without. I visited some sick people yesterday and never left my front porch. I mean, there are ways to do this. Okay. I was in prison and you came to me. There are people in prison right now. Whether they're physically in prison or whether they're in a prison of unemployment right now or a prison of poverty or a prison of hunger right now, there are people in prison. The righteous will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you to drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, get this, truly I say to you, if you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Let's unpack that real quick, okay? It it says brothers. If you did it to the least in the church, if you served the least in the church and blessed one another, then you also did it to Jesus. Because you know something? Jesus and the church are one. Jesus and the least person in this church are one. And if you're watching this and you've been isolated and nobody's contacted you and you feel like you're the least in this church, I want you to understand Jesus and you are one. And how we as a church take care of one another in this season is how we serve Jesus. When he returns, will we be caring for one another? We need to learn to care for one another and build believers. We need to learn that to serve this church means to serve Jesus. What does that mean for you? Some quick ideas. Why don't you start an online ministry of some sort? Do a Facebook post. Bless somebody. Have you seen Katie and all the, every day she makes a picture with scripture on it. Do you know how many people share and are blessed by that? Doesn't take her long. She does it to bless others. She's using what she has to bless others. But you could do the same thing. We could share scriptures. Start a group. Use Zoom or Google Groups or something, Google Hangouts. Start a group. Invite some people into a group. I've been using an app called Marco Polo lately. Look up Marco Polo. You can send a brief visual text message where you, I'm speaking to you, and then when you want to respond, you can respond back. You know, it helps me to see faces right now, and I think it would help you. Put Marco Polo on your phone. Friend me. Send me a message, and I'll send you something back. I'd love to see you and hear from you. Use FaceTime. Give. You know what my prayer for this church is? A lot of people are praying that the church survive this problem. I don't want the church just to survive. I want this church to prosper and be strong. I'd like for two things to happen. I'd like for us to be so blessed that we can bless other churches that are, that are endangered right now and that we could bless ministries that are endangered, that we could bless our partner Community Touch as they run their food pantry empty every day. Uh, Linda and I used to eat out more than we ought to, and we spent a lot of money eating out. Right now we're not. We're eating pinto beans. I really feel like that money needs to go toward community touch. If you feel the same way, why don't you give it and mark it for crisis relief, and I'll make sure that it goes to this community because some of us are saving money. Another thing I think I'd like to see, I'd I'd like to get the roof put on this building. I know this may be ambitious and, and trying to put a roof on in the middle of this time, but the companies that we have that have given us the estimates would be really blessed by a job where their people could be on a roof for a couple of days and they could, uh, it would be a job that would, they could do. And by the way, we're not using the building. So would you consider that this church doesn't need to survive? We need to prosper. We need to prosper. Serve one another. Sign up if you're willing to serve. The time's coming when we're going to have to visit the sick. The time's coming when we're going to have to do funerals. The time's coming where we're going to have to take care of one another. If you're willing to pick up some groceries for a shut-in, if you're willing to take care of another lcc or just let me know. Text me. Sign up and let me know that you're willing to shop or serve or do something. Call somebody. Pick up the phone and call somebody. Call the least, not just your circle. Yeah, I've been talking to some people. Well, call the least that you... Call somebody you haven't talked to in three weeks and see if they're all right. Share this service. Build a watch party. Share the YouTube channel. Share this. There were over a thousand people that saw this service last week. Whether they watched the whole thing or not is another story. Over 1,100 that saw it. And there were about six or 700, according to Facebook, that saw enough of it to say that they watched the service. 
you know, that we've, we've doubled or tripled our attendance during this season, share it. This is a season where we can bless others. Create a watch party. Do it to the least of these. Then he says in verse 41, I'll say to those on the left, the ones who didn't serve one another, depart from me. You cursed, uh, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil. And say, There's that fire thing again. There's that weeping and gnashing of teeth thing again. Here's this judgment thing again. It, it's not that you can earn your way into heaven. It's not that serving earns your way into heaven. It's just that those who are in the kingdom serve. And if you're not serving, maybe you're not in the kingdom. And then he repeats, I was hungry and you didn't give me food. I was thirsty and you wouldn't give me a drink. I, I needed welcomed and you wouldn't welcome me in. I was naked and you wouldn't give me clothes. I was sick and in prison and you refused to reach out to me. You refused to send me a text message. You refused. I'm not saying get in your car and go physically visit somebody. That's not wise right now. We are blessed with a time where we can text one another. I texted a lot of you yesterday. If I didn't text you, it's because I don't have your cell phone number. Text me your cell phone number. Uh, text me. I I'd love to stay in touch. Let's stay in touch and minister to one another. Then he'll answer them saying, truly I say to you, you did not do it to the least of these, so you didn't do it to me. You didn't care for one another, so you didn't care for Jesus. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. There are only two kinds of people in this world. There is no third. There are no middle ground Christians. There are no seekers. There are people who are in the kingdom and awaiting Jesus' return, and there's those who don't. And if this coronavirus crisis does anything, it's going to purify the church. The days where we're halfway Christians, the days where we, we're entertained by the church building and the pastor sits up here convincing me of how to act like a Christian are done. The days are here now where the spirit-filled body of believers who are willing to serve and willing to risk and willing to put themselves out for Jesus and willing to take responsibility for what he's given them responsibility for, those people are in the kingdom. And those who aren't in the kingdom, well, Jesus is returning soon. And we've already seen what happens to them. Those who move in the spirit, those who serve the least of the brothers, those are those in the kingdom. It'll be sudden and unexpected. Just like that. One second, and everything's changed. The door's shut, and there is, no, there is no way to go back. It's a permanent division. The division you choose now, do you choose to be in the kingdom or out of the kingdom now? Do you choose to be in the spirit now or out of the spirit now? That division will become a permanent division in your life. And, and, and those stories all tell us that the lost are surprised by it. The virgins didn't know they were without oil. Those who had beat their fellow servants were surprised that the Lord had came back. The lost are always surprised because we're motivatedly ignorant. We don't believe the Lord's coming back. Would you make your eternity secure? You can do that right where you are right now. Are you in Christ? Next week we're going to look at what it is to be in Christ. We're going to look at the cross. We're going to look at the fact that he died for you. He loved you so much he died for you to bring you into him. Because you were separated from him by sin. He forgave you and said, come, like the hen that we saw two weeks ago that wants to gather her chicks up under her wings and protect them. During this age of coronavirus, wouldn't it be nice to be under his wings? Wouldn't it be nice? How long are you going to run from Jesus? How long are you going to fight from Jesus? How long are you going to pretend like you're God of your world? How long are you going to pretend like there is no end and like Jesus is not coming back? Are you in Christ or not? Does your faith lead to action? Because if your faith doesn't lead to action... If you're not actively serving and blessing others, if you're not putting it out there and risking, if you're not doing what you're responsible for, if you're not using your faith to be further immersed in the Spirit, you may not have faith. Because where there's faith, there'll always be action. Would you accept Jesus? Would you accept the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? Would you consider giving? Would you consider reaching out to someone this week, today? Would you consider praying for one another? Maybe it's a time to join our prayer team. Would you consider preparing? Be ready. Jesus is coming back suddenly. What do we need to do? Be responsible. Be filled with the Spirit. Serve one another and know one another and reach out to the very least. Reach out to those who are on the margin. Reach out to those who are feeling unloved right now. Somewhere there's an LCC -er who hasn't been reached out to. I haven't thought of them. Maybe you can. Reach out to the very least. Reach out to those who are the most lonely. Dear Lord, we come to you right now. We accept you right now. We accept your spirit right now. 
Lord, we know you're returning, but we just accept your return right now. We just hold our hands out to you and we accept your presence and your return. We accept your lordship right now, Lord. We accept that we need oil. We need responsibility, Lord. We need to be serving. We need our faith to serve. Lord, would you use this season and this time to turn this church into the church that you've always designed it to be. For every person who hears my voice, who's in this, in this, uh, this virtual room that we have here, Lord, would you just fill them fresh and new with your spirit right now, Lord? I could see people breaking out in tongues across the region right now, Lord, right in their living rooms. Would you fill us with your presence right now, Lord? Would you take the worry of coronavirus away from us? And Lord, just let us know that there's an eternity coming that you've prepared for us, Lord. And Lord, if there's somebody who doesn't want you in their life, would you just let your spirit hound them this week, Lord? Would you, Your day is drawing near, Lord. Would you just uh, make them aware, Lord, that you're returning, Lord? We don't want to be foolish. Lord, would you just accept us as we worship you now, Lord? Thank you, Jesus.
From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man could ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Would you stand in that power? Would you stand in the power of the Spirit this week? Use your time not to binge Netflix or worry or stress or, or play some games. Would you use your time to stand on the solid rock this week? We're going to need it. Whatever's coming in this world right now, we're going to need a rock to stand on. And should Jesus come back, he's going to look for those who are on that rock. Would you place yourself in that rock? And would you let Jesus from that rock, allow you to reach out and serve someone in this church. Reach out today. Call somebody, text somebody, uh, use some app on a phone, but find some way to reach out to somebody today. Next week, we're going to have a special service. It's Palm Sunday. Um, next week, I want you to get a Sharpie, and I want you to have a Sharpie handy for the service because we're going to write. And um, So I'm not going to tell you what we're going to do with it, but I want you to have a Sharpie ready. We're going to celebrate Palm Sunday, and it looks like we're going to celebrate Easter the same way, and we're going to have some fun with this. We're going we're to explore Jesus. I think we can grow in the Spirit during this season. May God bless you. May God keep you this week. May He keep you in His Spirit. May He allow you, give you the power to serve others and the drive to serve others. May He make your calling and election sure. May He put you upon a solid rock. No matter what comes this week, Lord, we'll stand on a rock, whatever this world does. Lord, I ask you in, that, in your name, would you bless LCCers today? Would you bless those who watch this, this, uh, this, this video today? In your name, Jesus, I pray this. Amen.